Today, I'm going to interview real life structural engineering professionals and asking them what it's like uh, to be a structural engineer and their career tips for engineering students that want to get into the structural engineering profession. And they also have some really great tips on how to practice engineering in North America, especially if you're an international student. So I'd like to welcome Noah Moskovich and Mustafa El Mogi. They have a combined uh, 25 years of professional experience. Uh, they've mentored engineering students and they are also the co-founders of uh, the Structural Engineering Basics. It's a platform where you can learn about the basics of structural engineering and what it's like to work and get into the structural engineering industry. Uh, check out the link below. Uh, we have promo codes, 20% uh, discount and 40% discount. So definitely check that out in the links below. So welcome Noah, welcome Mustafa. How are you guys doing? Good, good. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank yeah, you. Thank, thank you for, for, for agreeing to be on. And um, you know, we, I did a quick intro. Could you guys just do a quick uh, summary of your careers and how you guys got to where we are for, for our viewers? Sure, yeah, uh, I'll start. So like Matt said, I'm Noah Moscovich and I am a professional structural engineer in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. I graduated about eight years ago, and right from graduation, I got a job at, I was lucky to get a job at one of the top structural engineering consulting firms. So ever since I started there to now, I've worked on projects all different sizes, from you know small little beam reinforcing details all the way to now I'm the lead structural engineer for schools and even some high-rise buildings, which is pretty awesome. Um, and then about a year ago, um, also on, on the side, I started with uh, Mustafa Structural Engineering Basics, where it's a platform where we teach non-structural engineers about uh, structural engineering. So that, that's about uh, it for me. <laughs> All right. Um, my name is Mustafa El Mogi. I'm a structural engineer. I'm originally from uh, Egypt. I did my undergrad uh, in Cairo. And uh, after graduation, uh, I got an opportunity to uh, go and uh, practice engineering in Dubai. That was a very interesting uh, experience. Uh, I got to learn about the design of tall buildings and reinforced concrete. That was a very interesting time. And then I uh, decided to go back, move back home, and uh, did my master's uh, degree and uh, decided to move to Canada. I did a PhD in uh, engineering and uh, decided to go back in the industry and uh, practice uh, consulting as a professional engineer. And uh, I worked alongside with uh, NOAA and then we started the um, uh, Structure Engineering Basics uh, program and try to help people understand the basics of structure engineering as much as we can. Awesome, thanks so much. You know, this uh, next question that I wanted to ask you guys is, how did you start your career in structural engineering? Like what got you interested into it? Because everyone has a different story. Um, what are yours? Um, you know, I, I, ever since I was a young kid, like I would go on family trips or something and I was always interested in large structures. And I don't know if it was how the structure was actually put together or just the shape of the structure. So I didn't really know until I got into uh, university if it was am I interested in structural engineering am I interested in architecture am I interested in construction so I have a bunch of architects in my family so they were sort of trying to push me in that direction but it took some time and I remember after my first year in university I was in a bit of a rut and then I read the description for civil engineering and it really drew my attention because there's just so many different types of civil engineering uh, out there and then there's also so many different types of projects and as I went through civil engineering I think it was about third or fourth year I realized that structural engineering was the path I wanted to take it just stood out to me like tall buildings buildings that you can see as you're driving to work every morning um, projects that you know everyone in the public is going to be occupying those space so you have a big responsibility and I like the fact that I could be a part of that uh, for me, uh, uh, I think a big part of it was uh, my father. He's a structure engineer, and so that got me curious. Uh, I remember growing up, I would hear him talk about like you know engineering terms, foundation levels, like 
uh, cantilevers, things like that. That got me curious. And then I decided to go to school and uh, get a bachelor uh, degree in engineering. So that really got things started. And right after uh, graduation, I got opportunity to work in a cool environment. Uh, that was back in 2005, um, the, the, the time I worked in Dubai, the tall high rise building industry was booming. So that got oh, me cool. even more interested in, in tall buildings and cool structures. And um, I, I took it further. I ended up doing my master's and a PhD. So um, it's a very interesting career. If, you, if you're um, um, curious how things are built and want to, you know, like engineering, uh, it's an excellent career. Yeah, I think that's, you know, at least for me, it's, it's kind of this getting inspired by those uh, landmark structures. And um, we now, you know, when I was really young, watching those modern Marvels engineering shows. And for me, it was, I was like watching um, a documentary on the Taipei 101 and just seeing how the how some of the key features were all structural engineering. And that was just such a big challenge, but it, that landmark was there forever. And that's really got my first, um, piqued my interest into structural engineering and, you know, eventually got into it once I got into college and um, it was tough, but eventually found my way to really liking uh, what I do with, and the analysis and, and just seeing how, 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 a great career path it is like you said Mustafa there's a lot of ways that you can get into it and what you can do with it too so that's great thanks for sharing that um what do you what do you guys do on a daily basis at work so I'm from the U.S. um and I think you guys worked in in Canada so is it, what do you guys do on a daily basis and you know I'm trying to figure out too like how different is it from uh, the U.S. like is it everywhere the same so I only have the experience working in consulting engineering. So, you know, it's in an office and you're going out consulting with many different owners, many different clients and the projects, the amount of projects that we do are endless and the different types of projects you do are endless. But for, you know, a lot of the students that are watching when you first when or at least when I first got into the industry, the day in the life is much different from now. So when I started, I probably was, doing you know, design checks for beams or load takedowns or just working under a mentor. If you're lucky, you'll have someone to guide you throughout the way. So working under someone, uh, assisting them, you know, reading codes, reading how things are done, going to job sites, figuring out how things are built, because that, that definitely takes time to get that right mindset and yeah. understand the details that you're, you're actually designing, making sure they are actually able to be constructed. But, now the day in the life for me has changed a bit because I'm now more of a project manager and I'm responsible for designing and project managing like larger projects. So a lot of my time is getting to my desk, dealing with emails, phone calls with clients, going to have meetings, you know, talking about more of the big picture of projects, um, having internal meetings with let's say drafters and the senior partners at my office. Um, and then, yeah, doing design, we're doing modeling. You can be modeling a big structure. Hand calcs are still part of it. Like we always like doing hand calcs to verify a model or if it's more simpler structure, we do that. And then I spend a decent amount of my day actually mentoring um, the newer professionals at our office or the new grads. So that's, that's my day. Um, it could change uh, year to year, but for me, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Uh, I, I agree with Noah. It's, uh, it's very interesting because uh, an undergraduate engineering program is very heavy on the technical side. So when you're going through school, uh, it's, uh, I, I used to think this is what engineers do all the time. They're just like uh, wake up in the morning and go to work and uh, keep crunching numbers and designing and modeling and do all the things you study in engineering. But uh, in real life, um, a lot is competing with your with your hours at work besides the actual design and modeling and the things that you want to put your technical uh, skills in. So uh, I agree, lots of coordination, lots of meetings. Um, you know, um, that could be like uh, lots of emails, phone calls, 
Uh, also, uh, coordination with your team in the office. Uh, Noah mentioned like working with uh, um, the drafting team. And um, also, the, um, the better you get and the more you practice engineering, you'll find like your colleagues and your engineers will come and ask you questions and you kind of spend time uh, mentoring them. And for me, this was always, always very rewarding because like you kind of give back and, and uh, I find you learn better and you understand things better when you explain it to others. So um, yeah, those are a few of the things that you will be doing on a daily basis. Oh, that's, yeah, thanks for sharing that. I know it's, like you said, consulting engineering. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much the same thing um, with the firm I work for. It's, you know, especially if you're younger, you, you do do a lot of technical stuff, which is great, but then you can't escape it. You're going to be coordinating, um, working with other people, answering emails. So there's definitely a lot of, that's, I think that's the number one shock on how much non-technical stuff that you need to do on a daily basis as an engineer. And so, yeah, it's, it's great yeah. to know that it's, that it's, it's pretty universal, and at least in terms of um, consulting engineering. And since we're kind of on that topic, what are the differences that you see in structural engineering uh, between, like, say, Canada, Egypt, the, the U.S.? Um, you know, the principles of designing structures are the same all around the world. At least they, they should be, right? So you're de designing a column. Uh, you're checking the compressive stress and, you know, the unsupported length. If you're designing a beam, you're seeing, like, uh, how much it can span without being overstressed, checking the stresses, the shear, the moment. But when it comes to, um, I guess, the codes, some of the codes would be different. They probably end up at the same result for the most part, but maybe I think in Canada, some safety factors are slightly different. Uh, than the U.S. and maybe other countries. It all depends on who's responsible, I guess, for the code writing associations, like who's in charge, who has the experience to say this is what we're going to do in our country, I guess. Um, and then also the designation process. So in order to become a structural or a professional engineer in Canada, I'm pretty sure it's a bit different than the U.S. They have a PE exam, and here we don't have that. So once you become an engineer, or once you graduate engineering, then you have to do four years, at least it varies province to province, but it's for the most part the same. You have to work four years under an engineer. So make sure you have a mentor there. You have to get the experience. You have to do professional development, get volunteer experience. And we also have an exam that we have to write called the uh, PPE, the Professional Practice Exam. So that's basically on ethics and uh, engineering law. So it doesn't go into any technical thing because in Canada, they sort of, um, you get your stamp after four years, you become a professional engineer and you have to get it written out or signed off by three senior mentors that you know that's worked with you, that knows you are going to be a competent engineer, but you're responsible for putting your stamp on something. And if you aren't comfortable, if you haven't designed something like that, then, you know, they trust you that you're a professional now that, uh, you're not going to put your stamp on something if you don't aren't completely confident in that design. So maybe the senior engineers at your office for the when you first get your stamp and your designation are still going to sign off on the, the huge projects. And in time, you'll get that uh, responsibility and that confidence to be able to sign those sign off on those types of projects. Well, that's yeah, that's interesting. So at least in Canada. There's not really a, a technical written exam. It's you're in the industry, you're working for a couple years, I think you said four, and then your mentors or your, your managers will sign off basically saying, hey, we've worked with this, uh, with this person and they're technically fit to stamp drawings basically. And that's how you get your license. Yeah. That's uh, interesting. Yeah. Like in the US, it's, it's um, yeah, there's a lot of exams. Um, Basically, when you're in college, you're during your last couple of years, you're expected to take an engineering training exam, or they call it the Fundamentals of Engineering exam. I think that's a six-hour test, and that's nationwide across the, the U.S. So you get your engineering training license first, and then you work in the industry for a couple of years. I think, uh, I think it's about one or two years, depending on grad school and whatnot. But basically, that one's a 
eight to 12 hour exam. It's longer in California. You have more tests in California for mm -hmm. seismic. But then that's when you can um, get your, your, your professional engineer stamp. And yeah, it's the same process too. You need to get mentors as, instead of saying that you are competent. Yeah, they do say that, but then, then you, have to, you have to take like an eight, 12 hour exam. <laughs> and then specifically, that's usually where it stops. You can, you can stop there, get your professional stamp. But if it, especially in seismic, zones like in California, it's almost expected that you eventually get your structural engineering exam, which is a level above your professional engineering exam. And that's the one that I'm currently studying for. And yeah, it's, um, it's all structural engineering, all structural engineering. It goes into buildings and bridges also. And bridges have a different code, obviously. So we got to know a little, a little bit about that too. But then it's, yeah, 16 hours. So usually on a wow. eight hours on a Friday, eight hours on a, on a Saturday. And the pass rates aren't that great. <laughs> They're like 30 to 40%. So that's a big chunk of, um, that's, that's the phase I'm going through right now. But uh, it is great when you get it. It's a good review, I think, of that. At least for me, as I'm studying right now, just all the fundamentals and all the things that you should know filling in all the stuff but yeah it's it's interesting to see how it's really um different in other countries too is that the same thing in uh egypt mustafa it's it's very uh, similar it's very interesting to kind of compare how different countries uh how you can get your engineering uh, license um and um it's uh based on the years of experience uh, I don't think there is necessary an exam, but uh, I believe it takes longer to uh, to be able to get your stamp or a consultant engineering uh, seal. And um, I, again, like it's a very interesting experience to practice engineering in different countries and you kind of get to compare. I got a chance to work in Egypt in Dubai and in Canada. And the good news is I agree with, with what you said, the fundamentals are the same. So that, that's great, you know, like your, your basic fundamental understanding of structure engineering is going to work. So that's, that's a relief. Uh, from there, you want to get yourself familiar with like the national standards and codes. So that would be the first kind of difference kind of thing. And um, surprisingly, well, not surprising because we know that the basics are the same. They're very similar. Like the main differences would be like just basically factors of safety, how different kind of countries regulate or feel comparable with like factors of safety in their buildings. Obviously the loads, uh, seismic loads are gonna be dif different by area and by country, wind loads as well. Another interesting point is like um, construction materials. So in the Middle East, uh, there is not a lot of wood structures. Uh, I had to learn the design of wood frame structures kind of from scratch in, in Canada. I know it's a very common and popular uh, construction material. So it would be differences like that. Um, you know, work with steel structures. It depends on like the e economy and what works best. Uh, some countries, the labor is like kind of more affordable. So they go more onto cast in place, concrete, reinforced concrete, formworks, and more label intensive construction uh, material. Um, and in other countries like steel frame might be the best and fastest way, uh, as I mentioned, wood frame. So these are a few of the differences I've noticed in uh, my career. Yeah, it's, what about the, like you're saying, it's the fundamentals. Do you guys use the international building code too? Is that like the, usually the international standard? And then it goes to, you know, state, et cetera, city. It so, is, it is. This is so interesting because um, a lot of the international projects I worked on were designed in the American standards. So especially I think in the Middle East, a lot of countries would, would just like adopt American standards or like approve it. This is like, if you design the project according to these standards, it's kind of approved. So um, it comes with everything. It comes with like the code, the, the standards, the international building code. Uh, it's, it's very interesting. And it um, having an experience like that uh, gets you ready to kind of 
uh, practice engineering on a more international level. So you're familiar with different codes, different countries. It's, it's a very interesting thing to do. Yeah, it's really interesting. That's something I, that I've always wondered about too. I haven't worked on an international project, so it's always interesting to see what, what, it's, what, are, what are the codes like, what, how, how different is it in, in uh, different countries. So that's, that's it's good to know. Um, uh, Mustafa, Noah, if you have anything to say about this, you know, a lot of our viewers are students from international countries. And I get, I get a lot of questions on, you know, how can they practice structural engineering in uh, the US, Canada, you know, North America, but I, I haven't done it. So, you know, all I can give is like advice that I got from my international colleagues. Uh, but uh, I know, you, I think you guys are more international. So what do you guys think? Do you have any advice for students that want to work in the US or North America? Uh, I can relate so much with this uh, question and I get it a lot from like uh, colleagues and friends. They, they ask me, how did you uh, do it? And uh, looking back at my experience, it's like a life changing experience. This is very interesting. Like if you're seriously considering doing this, well, you know, um, that's, that's a great experience. It's going to take a uh, time and effort and dedication. Uh, but then uh, very rewarding. So I, as I mentioned, I did my undergraduate in, in Egypt. Uh, and then at some point I decided to um, shift my career and study engineering and practice engineering in another country. And I uh, eventually moved to Canada. So uh, that's, a, that's a big change, right? Because yeah. leaving home and leaving your comfort zone is always challenging. So. Uh, depends like how similar or how different kind of the country you choose, you're gonna find like challenges in like, you know, meeting new people, new culture, new language, you might need to kind of work on the language. Um, but then the, the most um, useful um, kind of tip or experience I would like to share with someone that wants to take that uh, journey is to uh, not get overwhelmed with all the things that needs to be done because it's a lot. Uh, and um, just understand what needs to uh, happen in order to achieve your goal. So if your goal is to be a professional engineer and practice the profession in like a new country. So first thing I would suggest is go to the uh, engineering association website and understand what are the actual requirements. And then most probably you'll find a lot of steps that needs to be done. So the second thing is not to get overwhelmed. We usually kind of tend to kind of overestimate what we can do in a year. You would kind of try to fit everything. Oh, within a year, I could be just like a professional engineer and practicing in a new country. That could be overwhelming and very stressful. So don't put that much pressure on yourself. Uh, for me, it took about like four years or five years because the way I chose to do it or the way it worked out for me I decided to actually move to Canada and study. I started a PhD program. So that took me about four years, um, four years to finish uh, the program. And that, that in itself helped me a lot in a, in a lot of ways. So, so first, first of all, I got time to kind of adapt to the new culture, new place and uh, moving in Canada. Um, I, got a, I got a degree, so that helped when I kind of applied to the engineering association that I have a, a, a degree from Canada. Um, also my uh, advisor is a professional engineer. So the, the, the time I spent working with him counted as a professional uh, experience. So that made kind of the mentorship time needed to uh, get my full license uh, shorter. Uh, that time counted uh, for the professional engineering. And, uh, and then eventually it happened. I uh, graduated, I found an excellent opportunity to work in a consulting office, uh, do design of tall buildings, things I'm passionate about and I loved from like what I learned in Dubai and I was able to practice it in Canada. Uh, so looking back, wonderful experience. If, if you are willing to put the effort and uh, you find excited about a journey like that, totally recommend it. So... I have some tips, uh, not on the journey over here, but once you get here, I guess, because 
I've had a lot of engineering uh, international students in my courses when I was in, in my undergrad. And also our company has hired some really prominent engineers who are from all over the world who ended up in Winnipeg. So I know right now we have a really um, promising young engineer who's from China. He moved here five years ago. We have someone from Iran, someone who moved here from Greece. So it, it is possible. But one thing that I've seen is that all these people, they, they did what it takes outside of the sort of technical stuff to be able to get to the point where someone's willing to offer them a job. So that would be that they worked on their English. They went out and they did networking. Um, Cause obviously you're working in an English speaking country and Mustafa, I know he has something to say about this. So I'll let him, him chime in after this, but uh, you know, you're going to be communicating with clients in English, speaking with them, going to meetings, doing technical writing. So you have to work on that. And it's definitely showed that it's paid that hard work paid off for those um, employees at my office. And also I would say, you know, learn some of the slang and engineering link lingo that's, going on in the country you want to work in because maybe some things that uh, are said in your current country or how things are constructed might be a bit different from in that country. So do your research, make connections and, you know, practice, practice, practice. So even if it means right now, if you are in another country that's not Canada or the U.S., reach out to someone like us or reach out to an engineer over here in Canada or someone like-minded individual that you can start practicing that because English is key and start practicing your networking skills and your people skills because that's a huge reason why uh, engineering firms hire uh, employees. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Mustafa, did you have anything to add with regards to, um, you know, learning a new language? Like English isn't your, your native language, right? Yes. Yes, my first language is Arabic. So uh, it's very interesting, uh, the difference between learning a language, like learning, a, you know, the words and understanding the words and practicing it. So the challenging part with me was like, you know, understand like the references. Uh, I would understand the words, but uh, I don't understand really what people are talking about in the beginning. So that took a lot of paying attention, a lot of googling stuff so i totally agree with with noah it um uh practicing and understanding um the language uh is gonna be that um key part in communication you know as an engineer you're gonna need to be like a good communicator writing skills and and also like obviously speaking the language um and that's the kind of first impression that you uh, leave so um i know from um other international students have worked with, it might be kind of tempting to think, well, my technical sp uh, skills should uh, speak for themselves. I don't need to put too much time into learning the language or learning the culture or, or be an effective communicator. I, I know some engineers kind of tend to focus on the technical side and um, not pay so much attention to the more people skill and the more soft skills. Uh, but throughout my career, I've noticed that employers and uh, engineering companies, they would regularly most often hire on the soft skills and rely on the uh, technical skills to be taught on the job. So it's totally worth the investment. If you want to kind of pay attention and work on uh, your understanding of the language and the culture, uh, make sure you're communicating effectively with, with people you work around and people around you. I think it's going to pay off and help you quite a bit. Uh, definitely agree with that. I mean, yeah, I think the technical skills can get you in the door, but when you're having that interview with, uh, with your potential employer, that's when your communication skills really show. And I think that's where you basically, they decide to hire you or not that interview and <laughs> your technical skills aren't going to help you that much in like that one-to-one -one or that, that uh, group interview and that's and that's like the most important part that's where their employers are making decisions it's not really on the technical stuff they'll teach you that but like you're saying the communication and and soft skills um, I had a question too on so is it usually the trend that let's say if you're a student it's easier to go to school 
let's say grad school or go to a university at the country you want to work in and then um, apply to jobs in that area. Because I think at least for, um, you know, the colleagues that I talked to, it's, that seemed to be the way that they recommend, like be a student in the country you want to work in. And that way, if the company is higher at local universities and you're in that, that university, it's easier to, I guess, get in front of them. Is that like a trend that you see too? That's, that's a great point, Matt. That's exactly um, like the way I did it. I was, I was very fortunate to actually get a scholarship to study. So that was a huge help, right? Because, you know, like a big change like that could also like put a lot of financial strain on like what you're trying to do. So starting as a student at the beginning, it felt for me like a step backward because like I was engineer and I was practicing, you know, engineering and building cool projects. But then I decided to be a full-time student. So um, uh, I, that's how I mentioned how, that's how I did it. I uh, started uh, school in the country uh, I wanted to um, uh, work in. And then uh, you're right, um, local engineering companies, they, they usually look for like graduates from like uh, local universities. So I think that helped. And the way it actually worked, it was like the company I ended up working with um, they were looking for engineers at the local university. So that's how we actually connected. So uh, I, I agree with you. I think it makes things um, easier. Yeah, I would say it's, it's probably a bigger risk if you're going to go, um, let's say, you say you want to move there. I don't know whether it's moving and then start your job search, like with coming to Canada unemployed. I mean, there's obviously visa issues and citizenship stuff, but... Uh, I would think that if you were wanting to come over after your studies uh, in a country that's abroad, um, you would have to have potential job lined up or a job lined up already. I think it would be um, much easier to come as a student and you can have those five years as a student. You have your student visa uh, and then you can make relationships along the way, get some you know, intern jobs and it would be a lot easier to get that job and to stay in Canada or the US. I just want to add something because this is a really interesting point. I don't want to discourage anyone that wants to just go ahead and get their engineering license like they don't have to go to school again. I actually have a few friends that uh, like did that. Uh, but uh, that's a great point. I agree with what Noah said. Um, the challenging part is going to be going through the process. There might be some exams that needs to be uh, done. We talked about how the process involves exams and doing this on top of like moving uh, to a new country uh, on top of like uh, finding maybe work to get you going till you uh, achieve all the requirements. If you put on top of that like family or like, you know, additional expenses, it makes things complicated, but I know it's possible. So uh, so I think it's worth looking into it. I just didn't want to discourage anyone that wanted to do it in a different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I think that's great advice. And I think that's a lot of um, uh, students and engineers are, are grateful to hear that because uh, there's a lot of questions going on about that too. So it's, it's great that you guys can uh, really get some uh, great advice out there. So thanks for that. Uh, Kind of going back to students and you know when you know, your first job to uh, uh, what did you do when you were first getting your job to help yourself stand out and get that first structural engineering job you know when when i got my first job i was actually getting close to graduation and my plan was to go do a year abroad do some traveling some volunteering just explore the world and um Yet I had summer jobs that helped me prepare. Uh, so I had experience, which would have standed out in a resume. And I did a lot of uh, little things throughout the way, like join associations, go to some technical seminars and just meeting people throughout university, which really helped. But for me, I had, I went to a lunch and learn with the company that I'm currently working at. And they came to the university, they were out there to hire a couple students. And I'm pretty sure Mustafa and I may have went to the same lunch and learn because we started at the same at the same time <laughs> at University of Manitoba. But I myself had a small like window of an opportunity to make a big first impression because after they did the 
sort of uh, introduction and the presentation on the company. They walked around, they gave out pizza, and they were just sort of going up to people or they didn't talk to everyone. I had to sort of flag them down, get, the, get, get their attention, and then I had probably two minutes to make a really good first impression. I luckily had my resume in my bag because this was something that a friend told me that morning. Hey, there's this awesome company doing a lunch and learn. Uh, you might as well come. And I told him I'm traveling next year, but like, what the heck, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. So a lot built up to that, uh, you know, small opportunity there. Like all the time I spent preparing and working on my people's skills and, you know, learning about the industry and learning what employers wanted sort of helped me in that conversation because I know they didn't, in, they didn't ask many people for an interview from that. Day. So I was one of the, I call myself a lucky one, but I guess I did a few things right to get their attention. Um, so that's sort of how I made myself stand out and like all, all the little things that built up along the way to that sort of moment. Um, I would say there are two main tips or pieces of advice that I think um, um, work really well looking back on my career. Uh, first one, very similar to what Noah mentioned, like it's, uh, as I said, the soft skills. So um, understanding that technical knowledge and the courses you've um, learned is not everything, your personality is a big factor. So what kind of helped me was like, you know, having a pleasant personality, a sense of humor, I remember I was complimenting on like how I'm like usually smiling around the office, kind of that, that, uh, that, that helped. Um, on the interview as well, like it was brought up like that uh, the interviewers like that I had a sense of humor. I wasn't just like focusing on, on like the technical skills. And uh, that's very important because people are looking for people that they would be interested in working with. So, so you can put your sh yourself in like the employer's shoes and you would quickly realize that if you're, if you're busy and you need help and you need to hire someone, of course you want them to be competent, but you want them also to be like a good uh, teammate and a good uh, person to work with. So that's the first uh, piece of uh, kind of advice that really helped me. Uh, the second one is taking uh, ownership of your work, taking responsibility. So, so to me, that's a, this is a deeper and a, and a profound one because uh, we're, um, taking ownership and taking responsibility of the work you do and eventually, like if you get like the, uh, your professional kind of designation and, and take responsibility for, for your work, uh, it brings a lot of meaning to what you do and improves um, the quality of like your work experience significantly. So you're, you're focused on the quality of your work because you're putting your name on it and you're taking responsibility for it. And this will show in every step along the way in your meetings with your clients, you would be more goal uh, oriented and objective in your, um, you know, reaching your goals. Uh, you will understand that you're there to serve your clients. Uh, and um, so I find, yeah, just taking responsibility um, An ownership of your work improves a lot of things in your um, uh, kind of engineering practice uh, career. Yeah, that's great advice. I know, uh, Noah, you touched on um, what I got out of that was, hey, get their attention and make a great first impression. And that has nothing to do with engineering. It's, hey, get their attention and you better have a good resume or uh, you better, yeah, like make a good impression just by yourself. And that's something that a lot of, I think, engineers tend not to do. You know, they don't want to get attention and they just want to do the typical resume online thing. That's great, but you need like a freaking awesome, crazy resume to stand out from the rest <laughs> versus you go to like a, that lunch meeting, that lunch learn, you get to meet the people in charge and just have that one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, like you said, Mustafa, I mean, they're looking for people that, that, that they can communicate with because they're going to be spending what 40 hours a week with them. And if you're all technical, that's great too. But I mean, they, everyone has a computer that they can do technical stuff on. It's like you were saying the soft skills. I think that's, that's really great advice. So thanks for that. So 
let's say for, for uh, professionals, young professionals that have been in the industry for a while, what's the next step for them to uh, advance in their careers? Do you have any advice for young professionals that are trying to advance their careers? Yeah, I would say to, you know, um, like Mustafa said, take ownership, you know, um, show, try standing out by, you know, working hard, getting people's attention in the office and asking questions, asking good questions, making good connections, making new connections uh, with clients. Um, try ending up being the go-to person in your company uh, for a client. Let's say you did a small job with them. They really liked you. Uh, but usually they contact like the partner in charge or the senior people at your office. Try getting them to make you the number one contact saying like, hey Noah, I have a job. Uh, this is the type of project. Can you guys handle the work? Well, you're Phoebe. So doing little things um, and showing that you're not just the technical person and that you can sort of manage multiple things at once and you can bring value to your company. So there's lots of little things you can do. And you mentioned we have a student course and the student course, actually half of it is preparing to get that job you want. So a lot of things you can do outside of the technical stuff to um, make yourself stand out to get the job. So resume tips, interview tips, networking tips, lots of things. But the second half is goes into what it's like when you finally get that job. So we talk about the day in the life of a, structural engineer, but we talk about, like I said, not the technical stuff. So all the things that you have to do in order to advance your career or the things that you're going to be doing once you get past that early stage of just trying to figure out how things work. So um, yeah, I mean, there's lots of things, but it's more just show that you want, show the partners in charge, show the, the, your bosses that you want the added responsibility and that you look forward to it and you're willing to take it on. I, I agree with, with Noah. Um, there is also a part of it that depends on your personality. So it, you might need to challenge your comfort zone a little bit. So for like, you know, maybe a more introverted person, they want to, uh, you know, they're more comfortable with just focusing on the technical side and crunching numbers all day. And they become like the go-to person kind of to crunch the numbers and they're happy with that. So it depends on your goal and what you are comfortable with and what you want to achieve so if you want to eventually play like a more prominent um, role and get some more leadership in the um, uh, office or the environment when you work then the things that noah talked about are going to be very um, uh, important to to um, um, you know get yourself out there and accept responsibility uh, show leadership quality uh, communication is key um, and and it's the little things that you do like you know um, for example uh, you can think of like emails when you get emails from clients when you get a phone call if you're gonna take the initiative and and respond you don't have to have the answer right away I know this is a tip I learned you don't have to have the answer right away but clients uh, love it when you show them that they have your attention and just respond uh, you know, in a timely manner with just like maybe a simple line saying, you know what, I got your message, I got your request, I'm working on it, just get them involved. That's a good example of communication skills. And it also shows that you take your work seriously, shows that you have good leadership material. And these little things will develop into habits that will get you into that career trajectory uh, that you want. I love that point, uh, Mustafa, like you're saying, you know, even if you're an introvert on your personality, it's something that you can develop. Like you're saying, you practice it, it'll become a habit. And then eventually that becomes kind of your, your upgraded personality. So I think that's, that's great advice. And Noah, like you were saying, the focus on the, the clients. I think if you're, a, you know, a firm, I think one of the is it most important ways to help your firm out is to get repeat clients and to get repeat clients, you need to have those um, communication skills. The clients have to know, like, and trust you to do business with you again. And again, that's not a computer. So I think like really the next step is, you know, focusing on your communication, focusing on 
your clients. And that's one of the, the biggest ways that, that you can help your company out and that how you can stand out in, um, in your career. Uh, so thanks for that. That's really great points. And Noah, you mentioned, you know, your structural engineering uh, basics course. Why did you and Mustafa decide to, to do that? How did you guys get into that? And, you know, why? So it all started, um, my brother actually has an online advertising search engine optimization company. So he's really good with web design and online things and getting your, your company out there on Google and to the world and the, all over the internet. So he came to me and he said, hey, how about we team up and let's uh, do an online course or let's do a platform where you teach your knowledge. You, you know, you clearly you're, you're somewhat of an expert. You know a lot about structural engineering. That's your job. Let, let's do something. And at first I was tentative and I'm like, I don't know, what would I teach on? And, um, you know, who would my target audience be? And then one day, like, sort of or a week went by and I had so many questions from architects, contractors, owners. Um, and to me in my head as I'm talking to them, I'm talking to them on the phone or responding to the emails, I'm like, if only they knew a bit more about how structural engineering works, what went into the design of these structures, it would make their lives easier. You know, it would, would have prevented that RFI from the contractor because if they thought things through would have been able to find a solution on their own or maybe they didn't need to ask the question in the first place or for an architect who um, you know is doing a preliminary design but they have it all open space well, where are the columns where are the vertical support so it's a lot of little things and then it popped in my head I'm like Mustafa who sits next to me he's a professor like uh, why don't I get in on, in on our team and you know this would be a great fit and a great collaboration that get all our knowledge together and let's make a platform to do that. So we started with, um, you know, blogs, uh, YouTube videos, uh, we have social media, but then our ultimate goal was to make a course. So we started with a course on structural engineering and we did market research and students, future structural engineering students was one of those, uh, the main sort of target audience because we learned that, you know, if they want to get into the industry, um, they should know a bit more about what, how engineers do it, uh, do their design, and we use real world examples. So I know that a lot of them are keen to learn that stuff to help them stand out in the interview or if they are about to get or start their new structural engineering job. This definitely gives them a lot of background on um, you know, how we do everything so they won't act lost. They'll sort of be a step ahead of where their bosses thought they would be. Um, so yeah, like we made this and then we also came up with the idea for the student course also. And we like teaching people, we like uh, doing one-on-ones and the student course was for all engineering students, not structural engineering students. Um, and we give them the tips um, because we, we are mentors also and we sort of took what the students that were mentoring, um, all the questions that they had about getting the job, what life is like, because uh, they ask us all these questions like, you know, how am I going to learn this stuff? Uh, what's a day in the life of an engineer like? So we decided to come up with that. And now we're just working on new content, new blogs, potentially a few new courses in the future. But, uh, you know, it's in, it's in our, I guess, I don't want to say free time because we're busy engineers, but, you know, we're investing all the time we can uh, into this outside of doing our regular you know, nine to five job, and which in our industry, it's rarely that, so so <laughs> we're doing our best to share our knowledge. I I agree with with Noah. Um, a lot of it comes from like our genuine interest in what we do as structural engineers, and connecting with what professionals we work with um, uh, um, want to know about structural engineering. So at the beginning, we interviewed and we talked with a lot of architects contractors uh, to ask them about their frustrations or like things they want to learn about structure engineering because a lot of those professionals they hire structure engineers as part of their team and we found a lot of interest so that was a lot of uh, that was an interesting way to connect things that we want to talk about and we want to share with people and the need and demand to know this information so that was a perfect way to create that platform 
and then it, be it became natural to create content and 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 share information on it and get positive feedback so it has been a great experience yeah i'll, I'll add one thing it's just like we did some research and we googled it and we googled the structural engineering topic and really other matt other than your youtube channel there isn't really many people trying to explain structural engineering in a simple way that's easy to understand you know we we sort of not dumb it down but if you read one of our blogs we sort of use regular you know print talk when we're we're trying to describe something we're not using huge technical words uh, we're trying to do it uh, in a way that's easy to read and easy to understand so out there like googling it there's a lot on structural engineering and there's a lot of videos but not many sort of have someone break it down so there's no complicated formulas there's not just the uh there, it's the need to know stuff if you want to know structural engineering not the nice to know so we decided to make a platform for all of that uh, put it in one and hopefully you know it attracts some um, people who really want to learn about it uh, to make their lives and jobs easier that's what i really appreciate about um you know and mustafa like you said there's not too much content out there but there should be i mean especially if you're a student this is what you're doing you're you're Googling things on the internet, what's this career life choice that I'm making? Is it the right, <laughs> is it the right thing for me? That's what I did when I was a student and there was nothing out there. Uh, so I really appreciate it that you guys are, you know, making content for, for about structural engineering. And yeah, I, you know, I've gotten the chance to look into your course and your blogs. That's what I, one of the things I really appreciate about it is you guys make it simple. It, there's a tendency to get overcomplicated, especially with, with structural engineering. So I really appreciate the way you guys communicate that. And uh, especially with your, you know, I recently got a chance to go through the, your student course and that's what I really appreciate it because it's coming from a employer perspective, someone that's already been there, what advice would you have given yourself if you were still a student and as I was going through it, it was like, yeah, this is, this is what I would have told myself and what, what some of the things to focus on instead of just, uh, let's just say the technical stuff. So it was like really cool to see that, oh yeah, I wish I would have had this when I was a student. And I really also like the way you go into, not just how to get into the structural engineering industry as a student, but also what to expect. I think you guys do a really great job of showing some of the tasks that you'll be doing on a day-to-day -day basis as a intern or as a new entry-level engineer. And I think that can really give a student an edge because most of the students that are probably going into these job interviews don't know anything about how the structural engineering industry works. So if you go in there and you're saying, hey, this is, let's just say an intern position. Hey, I wanna get this intern position. I know you guys do this, you know, I can do RFIs. I know what construction documents is. I know what's important to your company because you already have a feel for that. I think that's what's really cool about that course. Um, so yeah, thanks for, thanks for that. And you know, for our viewers, we have a promo code. It's 20% off. Check the link in the description if you're interested in their, uh, their structural engineering basics course. We have a 40% off promo code in the description below. Uh, click on that. It'll, you know, help support the channel too, but also hopefully give you some value as well. So Noah, Mustafa, I really appreciate you guys uh, coming on and, and sharing all of your, your knowledge and experience. Thank, Thank you for having us. This was great. Let's, let's do it again. Yeah, definitely. I think it's great to have more structural engineering uh, uh, industry content creators on and, you know, let's spread the word out. Hopefully more structural engineers can you know share their knowledge as well to kind of just bring this whole community together so thanks guys thank you